Thanks very much for coming and supporting Dr. Jeffrey Hergen rather from California, who's travelled a long way to uh, share with us uh, some very interesting uh, and interesting insights really into cannabis medicine. Uh, yesterday he spoke about cannabis and pregnancy and today he is speaking about really um, cannabis medicine and its future in sustainable health care and you know really how will cannabis medicine continue to develop will it be considered always as an alternative medicine or will it be uh, basically fully integrated into allopathic or modern western medicine so it'd be lovely to hear jeff some insights on that and uh, dr hergen rather is uh, a gp specializing in cannabis medicine since 1999 but if you were here yesterday, you would have heard his experience dates back um, into the 70s, 1977. And he's a founding member and past president of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, which is a non-profit corporation dedicated to quality patient care, education and clinical studies. And he's also a member of the International Alliance for Can Cannabinoid Medicines and the International Cannabinoid Research Society. So it's very exciting to sa have such an eminent speaker travel all the way from California to Nimbin. Um, so please make uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hergen rather welcome. Thank you very much, Kath. I, I appreciate it. Um, my wife and I are delighted to be here in Nimbin. It's not our first visit to Nimbin, but it is our first uh, Mardi Gras festival, so I'm honored to be here and, and part of this uh, uh, festival. Uh, this is a broad subject, and I, I'm kind of left initially with where am I going to go with this? Uh, it's, uh, it's it, well, uh, we'll develop it as it goes along, I guess is fair to say. Uh, as was uh, mentioned, I am a GP, I'm a solo practitioner, so I've never been in one of the big healthcare systems uh, where, for the most part in the United States, if you're part of a healthcare system, you don't really get much say about what you do. You kind of prescribe what is prescribed and you practice medicine the way you're basically told to practice medicine. So as an independent, I have really the opportunity to to uh, embrace cannabis as medicine and have throughout my career, which is now almost 50 years as a uh, physician. So I uh, have a brief bio here. I don't want to dwell much on it except to say that in my practice as a cannabis specialist over the last uh, 25 years, I have seen about 3,700 patients. and. This is uh, not that great a number compared to other cannabis physicians in, in California, or for that matter, around the country. Uh, there are some that uh, have numbers of uh, 10,000 or more patients. And this is on account of the fact that I have a practice that I based on what I thought was a more uh, sustainable and a more defensible uh, practice of medicine, and that is to review records prior to seeing patients to spend about an hour with them and on their, on their initial visit and to develop a treatment plan and follow-up plans so that it was a, a real medical relationship with patients. Uh, over those uh, many years that I've been in this practice, uh, the most common diagnoses are listed here as, com uh, as chronic pain, uh, cancers, uh, mental ill health or mental disorders, uh, autism, epilepsy, dementias, uh, gastrointestinal disorders, insomnia, uh, neurologic or neurodegenerative diseases, harm reduction, which includes opioid uh, dependence, antipsychotics, and antidepressants, which are given out so freely in American medicine. And the, and the problem that I see is polypharmacy, which m means that, you know, with each decade of life, Americans typically end up on another drug. So that by the time you're on, you know, 70 years old, you might be on seven medications. Uh, so this polypharmacy problem is uh, interesting because people are, are being treated for symptoms of the medicines they're taking and piling on more and more medicines. Unique with cannabis is it's good for so many things they are often able to discontinue their use of many medicines when they're embracing and using cannabis as medicine. 
So what is cannabinopathic medicine? Uh, this is my opinion, and it's, you won't find it with all docs, but uh, in my opinion, we're wanting to utilize the full potential of the cannabis plant as a medicine. And in doing so, we're augmenting these cannabinoid receptors uh, in our body, upregulating the cannabinoid uh, receptor tone, and uh, balancing this natural endocannabinoid system in our bodies uh, to make up for what would be clinical deficiencies, to promote health and uh, well-being. So in my opinion, this starts with really legalizing the cannabis flowers uh, for personal use. We've done this in California, finally. Uh, I watched this evolve for decades where we got bills as far as the governor's desk and uh, with the opportunity to legalize the cannabis and they were turned down over and over again and it was uh, finally uh, that you know we we reached a point where the cannabis was legalized and people could actually grow cannabis in their own yards as their as their herbal medicine so i think it's very important uh, to be able to get to that point where we can legalize the cannabis plant, uh, not to mention cannabis medicines, and we'll talk more about that. I think we do have to tax and regulate cannabis for commercial use, and this is something that, you know, I didn't think I would hear myself say that because I'm a proponent of the plant, but when it comes to providing medicines to the public, I think it's important to be able to analyze the medicine and control the dosing so that it's more, so that it's safer for the public to be able to consume cannabis medicines and not get wildly stoned and uh, dysphoric with their initial efforts to use cannabis medicine. Uh, Again, I'll talk more about dosing as we go along. I think this also lends to the idea that we need to provide for certificates of analysis of the cannabis. Not only cannabis sold as flowers for people that can't grow it for themselves, but to certify, have a certified analysis of the cannabis products that are coming into the dispensaries. So this is very important. And if you look at the packaging of cannabis medicines in California, the font is extremely small. And you know, whenever I ask people, Uh, in my initial interviews with them, often done by Zoom these days, uh, I'll say, well, what is in the medicine? What's the milligram dose? Is it THC or CBD and so forth? I'm asking these questions and they'll just throw up their hands and say, oh, I've got to get my magnifier, my glasses or these, uh, you know, these uh, magnifiers in order to try to read what's on the packaging. We could simplify this a great deal by requiring uh, a, a QR code on a, on a package so that you can click and analyze what is in the cannabis medicine. So I think this is a direction that we need to go. We not only need to talk about the cannabinoids in these medicines, but also the terpenes, the terpenoids, and other compounds that affect the way that the cannabis works. I've crossed out the bottom lines here because this is not what I believe in. I don't think that synthetic cannabinoids are the way to go. They have been tried and there have been uh, problems, deaths from this, and I, I'll explain this a little more detail. Uh, there have been cannabinoid blockers produced by the big pharma uh, companies. Uh, I'll tell more of that story as well. And we can also, with chemicals, manipulate the natural metabolism, metabolism of the natural endocannabinoids, the ones that are already there in our bodies, and in doing that, by, meta- by manipulating the metabolism, we can upregulate our natural cannabinoid system. So it sounds logical and sounds like it might be a good thing, but in practice, this really hasn't uh, proven to be uh, safe or effective. Uh, I'm gonna give a couple examples in this case, and one was with the FA inhibitors that came out in 2016. What this means is, that one of the main natural cannabinoids in our body, anandamide, is metabolized by fatty acid amide hydrolase, or FA. And so this FA uh, enzyme is in our bodies to break down the endocannabinoid rather quickly. So when the signal is made with the natural cannabinoid, it goes uh, 
to break down the natural cannabinoid and end the signaling. Again, this, as I mentioned yesterday, this is, uh, these cannabinoids are produced on demand in order to accomplish some need within the body. So if we can stop the natural metabolism of this uh, cannabinoid, this natural cannabinoid, that will cause this to build up and have a more sustained effect. Well, they tried that in uh, a product that was made in Portugal, and, this, and the French were willing to do a clinical trial. There were about a half a dozen people that entered the trial in France in 2016, and after giving a FA inhibitor, one died straight away, and the other five had to be hospitalized. They obviously didn't go through clinical trials in any sort of meaningful way, or even animal trials, to see if these drugs were safe. They weren't safe, and they were removed from the market. Uh, the um, Bial trial, as it's known, uh, led to Johnson & Johnson suspending their own uh, clay, uh, phase two, two trials of different FA inhibitors, and uh, precautions were given to anybody else that were making these compounds because they just weren't working out. They were not safe. Another one of these trials was in a, a CB1 uh, receptor antagonist. Now, our natural receptors are uh, open to natural cannabinoids that activate the cannabinoid receptor, and in general, the result of that is down-regulating the way the system works. So if you're anxious, it reduces anxiety. If you're depressed, it reduces depression. If you're in pain, it reduces the pain signaling. So in general, what's happening with cannabinoid tone is that by activating the cannabinoid receptors, we're quieting the brain down and quieting the receptors down. Well, what happened with Sanofi Aventis was that about 20 years ago now, they began a campaign to educate the, the doctors saying, we're coming out with something new. We're going to provide a cannabinoid receptor antagonist. Well, part of the reason that uh, cannabinoids are interesting and useful is they can stimulate the appetite. So the idea of Sanofi Aventis was, if we produce a cannabinoid receptor blocker, we can stimulate uh, weight loss. And in fact, that's what it worked in, in clinical trials. People took the cannabinoid blocker, they lost their appetite, they were even repulsed by food, they lost five or 10 kilos, and then it kind of tapered off and didn't do much after that. Well, when they finally were releasing this in clinical trials in Western Europe, they found that people were getting uh, ill. They were getting depressed, and they were having suicides occurring in people that had never been depressed before. So, John, uh, so Sanofi Aventis had to pull that back from clinical trials and say, well, we're discontinuing this as a, uh, as a medication that they were uh, spending millions and millions of dollars to promote. I had the opportunity to speak to this uh, before it was even in clinical trials. In 2005, I was at an ICRS, an International Cannabinoid Research Society meeting in Pestum, Italy. And as the, as the conference was closing, Sanofi Aventis uh, chaired a, a conference among the speakers of the conference. They got together and they were promoting this idea that here comes this new cannabinoid receptor. Get ready for it, promote it, we're about to release it. And my comment to the, con to the conference at that time was, how can you block a cannabinoid receptor and have no idea what that's going to do? When we, use, when we activate cannabinoid receptors, what it does in our body is it helps us to eat when we need to eat, and to sleep when we need to sleep, and to relax when we need to relax, and to forget when we need to forget and to protect our bodies in many, many different ways. So to use it as a drug to, to promote weight loss and ignoring all these other functions is just senseless. And I made that comment and was not well received in this conference, but I had the opportunity to say it long before we got to the point where we had to, where Sanofi Aventis had to pull this from the marketplace. So what am I treating in my cannabis practice? And what are doctors that are cannabis specialists doing uh, treating in, in their practices? And this is a list more or less in rank order uh, over the last several years since we legalized the adult use of cannabis. Still, pain is the primary uh, role that we use, in, use uh, for 
uh, cannabinoid medicine, or for cannabis medicine. Acute pain, chronic pain, and neuropathic pain are all treated successfully with cannabis. Cancers can be treated. This can be misleading to people, and you have people coming in with uh, horrible cancers, often stage four cancers, wondering if can cannabis is gonna cure their cancer, and willing and able to take massive amounts of cannabis in hopes that this will kill the cancer. Uh, apparently, this happened uh, with uh, a guy named Rick Simpson up in Canada, in Ontario, Canada, about uh, 20 years ago. And he, he had a cancer, he took a concentrated cancer uh, cannabis formulation, a, a Rick Simpson oil is what it became known as, and he was one of the lucky ones where it actually seemed to kill the cancer or stop the cancer growth, and he was successful in treating the cancer. So Simpson began to produce his oil and sell it all over the continent, and for many people they may have had successes, but for most people he didn't. But uh, there was no way of monitoring the results of those trials, and so it, it still is uh, the case that people will come and say, I've got some RSO, and I'm ready to treat my cancer. How do I use it? So it's not that simple. There are some cancers that seem to have the proper receptor or the cannabis is proper to where it can alter the, the growth and development of these cancers, and it can be very effective in a rare few cancers. For the majority of cancers, it doesn't have that strong an effect, but can certainly help with the symptomatic treatment of cancer. <coughs> Mental disorders, anxiety, PTSD, uh, ADHD, and others are all uh, well treated with cannabis. And uh, there's something that I think is worth pointing out, and that is that uh, in ADHD, there's some circuitry in the brain that gets really overactive. Uh, it's known uh, in the scientific world as the LCSCP uh, uh, circuitry. It's a, sm it's a group of, of organs in the brain that get real busy, and when that's occurring, people with ADHD just can't focus their attention. Well, it turns out that those neurons in the brain are rich in cannabinoid receptors, and when treated with THC-rich cannabis, it quiets those receptors, helps the brain to uh, be able to organize and organize thoughts, and people are much more successful in dealing with their ADHD when using a THC cannabis. Uh, I had the opportunity to write a paper on this subject uh, as a... Um, uh, as a student in, a, in the uh, cannabinoid, uh, cancer and cannabinoid laboratory in uh, Haifa, Israel in 2019. And uh, what we were able to find was we took patients that were allowed to use cannabis in Israel, we asked them if they did have ADHD, and a few hundred responded to say, yeah, I have ADHD. Uh, so we further the, furthered the question with these people and ask them more about, well, what are they using? So we wanted to know if there was a particular kind of cannabis that was best for their ADHD. And what we found was there, it was all over the place. Anything that was rich in THC seemed to be the product that they were interested in. When they used it, the THC quieted those circuits and helped them with their focus and attention and made them really much more functional. Those that had the higher prescription quantities in Israel seem to be get, getting by with cannabis only for the treatment of ADHD, whereas those with the lower prescription quantities in Israel were typically using stimulants that were typical pharmaceuticals for ADHD. But nonetheless, they used the cannabis to quiet their brains and typically would use that more after work uh, and in, at bedtime to ease their ADHD. Gastrointestinal orders of all kinds, uh, ulcers, heartburn, reflux, but also inflammatory bowel disease and a number of other GI conditions are successfully treated with cannabinoids. Insomnia is remarkably effective in treating most people with insomnia. Sometimes people will try it once or twice and say, oh, my brain gets so busy I can't settle down and go to sleep. It doesn't work for me. What I have to tell people using cannabis for insomnia is, 
bear with it for a few days. What you'll find is that your brain will kind of get over this busy brain activity and you'll settle into a groove and be able to sleep uh, all night, often longer than you could otherwise. When you're using cannabis inhaled, you can get an induction of sleep that's very helpful and useful for getting to sleep, but because of the metabolism over the next couple hours and the, and the smoked cannabis is gone from the bloodstream, it's often helpful to take a, a cannabis product that orally that has a much longer duration of action. So using it for insomnia is very helpful. Uh, using it for dementia, this is a big part of my practice at this point uh, since the legalization of cannabis for adult use. For dementia patients, they are not going to know how to use cannabis and their families will often come asking for support in how to treat their loved ones uh, with dementia. So it's, uh, as I say, gotten to be a big part of my practice in treating people with dementia. It quiets the brain down, it helps them to sleep, it helps their mood, it helps their injurious behaviors and their outbursts and their uh, insomnia and sleepwalking at night and so forth. Uh, it's able to quiet their brains down and help them to rest in ways and to be more congenial and happy and hap good hearted and participate in ways in their, in their communities in these nursing facilities that they were unable to do prior to using cannabis. Neurodegenerative diseases respond well to cannabis. This includes conditions uh, that are, oh, like uh, lupus or uh, Parkinson's disease and others. I, I have a list of them that I'll show briefly in the f as slides come along. But neurodegenerative diseases are often eased by the use of cannabis. Uh, using it for harm reduction is very important, and especially as an alternative to opioids. Spastic disorders, no matter what the cause of spasticity, whether it's cerebral palsy or stroke victims that are in muscle spasm, when they use cannabis, it helps to relax those muscles and be able to have a more functional life. Autoimmune disorders, uh, like multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, so in these conditions, again, cannabis can be very useful and may be sufficient in, the, in and of themselves rather than conventional pharmaceuticals in treating their autoimmune diseases. Cannabis is good for glaucoma and it's in, in that class of functions where it eases the body and, and helps protect. Uh, it reduces the intraocular pressure and it's neuroprotective. You've heard the term given, and what this means is that the neurons are maybe under duress uh, in glaucoma from, from increased pressure, and if it can protect those nerves from breakdown and from, from uh, killing the nerves, it preserves vision. So it's useful in glaucoma, and it, people with glaucoma will often say their peripheral vision gets very cloudy and they can't see very well, and if they take a dose of cannabis, immediately is, is noted to be effective in improving their vision. So I do use it in glaucoma patients. Uh, skin diseases are very helpful to use cannabis. Cannabis is a wonderful topical and can be used as a concentrated oil or it can be used as a more diluted infused oil, just as a, a body oil on the skin. Uh, if it's used on a regular basis, it can reduce or eliminate some of the degenerative changes in the skin typical of aging skin. Uh, I would like to use it really as an antibiotic ointment so the concentrated oil can be used instead of an antibiotic ointment to put onto lesions and in using it in that way uh, it will protect uh, its pain relieving and it's also um, able to, uh, uh, as a, it's a potent antibiotic and so the, uh, the MRSA uh, staff uh, bugs can be killed by use of this, con uh, this concentrated cannabis oil. So I think it's an excellent product for use on skin diseases. Half Sorry? Half is that oil. How what? Half is the oil. Uh, I like to use it as that Rick Simpson oil, very concentrated oil. 
So if you've extracted the uh, cannabis oils with alcohol and then reduce the uh, oil down to the thick, sticky, tarry substance, you can put that on a Band-Aid and use it as a, a topical anti, anti, uh, antiseptic and pain relieving ointment uh, under a Band-Aid. Uh, it's homemade, it's a very dark brown or black oil. It can be made commercially without the chlorophyll in it, which turns it dark. And so it's, it would be okay uh, visibly to use it on the skin. But if you're making it at home, it's quite dark and is uh, unsightly to use on your face. Uh, you might use it on skin elsewhere on your body, but it's sticky and you have to cover it in order to use it that way. Uh, epilepsies autism, Tourette's syndrome, dystonias are all treated qu quite uh, effectively with cannabis. Uh, not all cannabis works, but in my experience as a clinician back in the 70s, it was the high THC cannabis that was so effective against epilepsies. Uh, in recent years, we've come to understand that CBD is an effective anti-epileptic, and so that is become popular, but it's not just the CBD, it's the THC that really is a very effective anti-epileptic drug. I, I use it in autism almost on a daily basis for my patients. As I'm seeing new patients with autism, I encourage the use of cannabis. Often we start out with something more balanced in THC and, or CBD or and CBD. Uh, but it's remarkable because kids with autism, sometimes they're really highly dysfunctional. They, they don't do well with other kids. They're often isolated. They may be headbanging, sitting alone. They might get involved in use of an a, a, a iPad or something for entertainment. Uh, but they're very isolated kids and they, they are often uh, exhibiting self-injurious behaviors, picking, scratching, uh, and they are often violent. And by the time they get to be big teenagers, they're hitting and biting and shoving and being really quite fear, you know, frightening to their parents. So as soon as I can get these kids onto cannabis, uh, we're seeing them chill out and get happier and m much more social creatures. And it's really uh, quite uh, uh, beautiful to see the effects of cannabis in autism. Tourette's, it quiets Tourette's syndrome. Dystonias, again, not unlike uh, uh, spastic disorders, dystonias can be quieted great, a great deal with the use of cannabis. In migraine headaches, people can use it episodically for migraines. They may feel a headache coming on. If they use cannabis immediately, it often stops the development of the a migraine headache. Uh, so that can be used more at, you know, as needed rather than on a daily basis. Whereas most of these other conditions, well, you can kind of imagine. Each has its own uh, use pattern. And, and to some degree, I'll talk about that more as we go along. Where is this endocannabinoid system? You may already know this, so I won't spend a great deal of time on it, but the endocannabinoid system is evident in the genes of these receptors that are evident in animals as simple as the hydra and the sea squirts, but really all throughout the animal kingdom. We don't see it in insects, but we see it throughout the animal kingdom. And this allows us to project back and say that these uh, systems go back perhaps 600 million years in helping creatures, animals to survive. And so again, as I mentioned, to help eat, sleep, relax, forget, and protect, that is a function that helps these animals to survive, even very simple animals. So we usually speak of it in terms of human beings, uh, but it, it, it's really there throughout the animal kingdom. When we look at the receptors, uh, or rather the cannabinoid molecules, on the left-hand side, the blue molecule is one of the predominant natural endocannabinoids, anandamide, and you can see next to this is THC. They have a very similar set, uh, shape, and because of this similarity in their morphology, the THC actually gets into the receptors and activates it just as the natural cannabinoids would do in the brain or throughout the body. Uh, in the brain, these receptors can be uh, seen by radio labeling the, the cannabinoid that you're injecting into the body, and over the course of uh, an hour or less, 
these receptors are activated by the cannabinoid and they show up uh, in those uh, receptors in the brain and uh, it's, um, it's those receptors, those CB1 receptors that we're aiming at for many of these uh, pharmacologic actions. But the CB1 receptor is not the only receptor we're talking about here. There are about 20 different receptor systems in the body that are activated by cannabinoids. And so it's not just the CB1 receptor, it's the CB2 receptor, which I see, uh, which I'm showing you in this next uh, slide. When you inject the uh, cannabinoid again into the body, it shows up first in the liver. Sorry about that. Uh, and then it uh, is also visible in the spleen, that other uh, red body on the other side of the spine. And then it starts to show up in the, in the um, spinal uh, column and throughout the bones. So over the course of 102 minutes, you see that these receptors in the CB2 receptor world are activated throughout the intestinal organs, the abdominal organs, the liver, uh, the spleen, the ovaries, and so forth. They're all over the uh, organs of the body uh, and in the lymphatics. So these uh, cannabinoid receptors are actually a mobile group of receptors that are circulating in the body uh, in the um, lymphocytes, the macrophages uh, that are circulating and looking for problems in the brain and the body. This is just showing you how similar the CB1 and the CB2 receptors are in terms of the amino acid sequence in these two receptors. I think this will stop advancing in a minute, but uh, I may have to keep my finger on the trigger. Uh, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors are very similar, but the CB2 receptors in this mobile set of uh, receptors are shorter uh, in this mobile set of receptors. If we alter one of the dots in this amino acid sequence, the receptor does not work as well. Uh, it, it creates a pocket in these uh, in these uh, cell membranes, and if there's one difference in the amino acid, the endocannabinoid doesn't seat as well, and so it doesn't work as well. So this is something that we've come to recognize in cannabis medicine, is that when we're activating these receptors, they don't, you know, the natural receptors may not be working as well from one person to another. And this is the point that I'm making here. The endocannabinoid systems don't work the same from person to person. And we can see these in the genes and we call them single nucleide polymorphisms. And this represents a, a set of uh, conditions where the receptors are the same within certain diseases. And so as I go on to list these diseases, people with a certain dis, uh, subtypes of schizophrenia, people with migraines, people with multiple sclerosis, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, depressive disorders, irritable bowel syndrome, and so forth. All of these conditions, my, uh, fibromyalgia, this gives a, an explanation for the inheritance of fibromyalgia. So these CB1 receptors are clustering in these different diseases. And they, again, don't work as well, making us prone to the, to the consequences of these diseases. In the second page, we see another set of them that includes some of the seizure disorders. Uh, interesting to note that this Japanese researcher, Matsunaga, uh, gave a questionnaire to people and showed that w people with a real happy disposition had similar cannabinoid CB1 receptors. Uh, so that um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a deficiency to have happiness, but it's interesting to note that the CB1 receptor in these people that have a real happy disposition are also clustering and in, in the same in that population of people. Uh, here's ADHD and PTSD uh, down the list. And again, these people have receptors that just are not functioning quite the same as another person's. So when we're using plant cannabinoids to activate these receptors, we can augment the natural system, upregulate that cannabinoid system, and quiet their, body, uh, their brains down so that they are more functional human beings. Also, the diseases of aging 
is a, an issue where we can see that the uh, endocannabinoid system is wearing out. It does not work as well. And with that, we, it, we have a plausible explanation for certain diseases appearing in aging. So people may be entirely normal until they get into old age. Now they're dealing with chronic pains, with degenerative diseases, with anxiety and depression and insomnia, and cancers are showing up. Uh, it may be an explanation in that the endocannabinoid system isn't working as well at this point in their lives, and now they're prone to these degenerative diseases of aging. The plant cannabinoids can be very helpful in these diseases. Uh, upregulating the cannabinoid system and bringing people into better health and balance. So we have a wide range of uh, dosing and frequency of dosing depending on uh, these various conditions. Uh, there are enzymes in the liver and I don't want to dwell on that in this talk, but suffice to say that the cannabinoids, the plant cannabinoids are metabolized in the liver rather quickly and uh, they are converted to inactive metabolites. Uh, what we see in use of other pharmaceutical drugs, they may be metabolized by the same uh, uh, cytochrome P1, uh, P450 uh, metabolic pathways as the THC and the other cannabinoids. But what is important to note is, for most people, there's plenty of ability of the liver to metabolize both the natural cannabinoid or the, the uh, plant cannabinoids and the pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, there may be a difference in concentration of the pharmaceuticals by five or ten percent of the concentration they would have otherwise if they weren't using cannabinoids. But if they are using cannabis, it can alter those blood levels slightly, usually to no harm. Uh, there is one exception to that, and that is when people are using high doses of CBD, and people will use hundreds of milligrams of CBD in an effort to control seizure disorders or other uh, medical conditions. And in the case of an anti-epileptic drug called Clobazam, they compete for the same pathway in the body, and when high doses of CBD are there at the same time as, as a dose of Clobazam, the metabolite of Clobazam called Desclobazam is so sedating that people will hardly wake up. Uh, so I had a, a family call me from Seattle a, f a couple years ago and they said, well, we're on high CBD and our doctor changed uh, our child's uh, anti-epileptic drug to Clobazam and that was the tip off right there and the child will hardly awaken. They will awaken long enough to sip some water and then they fall right back asleep. And I'm going to just say to them, you either have to stop the CBD or stop the Clobazam because they're both competing for the metabolic pathway and causing these high doses of Desclobazam and interfering with their ability to wake up. Uh, it wasn't dangerous to them, but it's frightening and a condition that can be dealt with simply by discontinuing either the anti-epileptic anti drug and changing it to another uh, variety of anti-epileptic drug. So you may have seen these uh, graphics. I'll show you a couple of them. This is smoked cannabis. It could also apply to inhaled cannabis. And we see a peak blood level within about 10 minutes. Uh, the dotted line is peaking at about 10 minutes. And then over the first hour, there's a, a very steep drop in the blood levels until after about an hour or two, there's no significant amount of THC in the bloodstream. So, what the THC is being converted into is initially into a drug called 11-hydroxy-THC, the, the dashed line at the bottom of the graph, and then the solid line is carboxy-THC, which is pharmacologically inactive. Police love to look for this drug because it lasts for days and days in the body. It's not pharmacologically active, it's not impairing in any way, but it's there. And so it's more useful to uh, law enforcement than anybody else. Uh, when we ingest cannabis orally, we see quite a different curve. So now the blood levels don't begin to uh, show up for about a half hour, at which time the, the carboxy THC begins to show up because the liver is so effective in breaking down these uh, cannabinoids, the THC, that they will be inactive by the time they reach the bloodstream. 
The THC is on the very bottom line, and it peaks after about two hours and lasts for about four to six hours before it's gone. And then the, the other compound, 11-hydroxy-THC, uh, uh, also highly psychoactive, is this uh, other curve that's more prominent than the THC, and again, peaks at about two hours and then tapers off for several hours before it's gone. Now, there's one exception to this, and I think you should be aware of this, and that is uh, the difference between taking oral cannabis products on an empty stomach, which are these solid lines to the left side of the curve, and the dotted lines when you've taken the cannabis with a fatty meal. So if you're taking it with ice cream or peanut butter sandwiches or uh, other fatty meals, pizza or whatever it might be, you're going to prolong the curve and move it to the right. So now you're not going to peak in your cannabis uh, blood levels for about three or four hours. And then it tapers off much more slowly over the course of six or eight or 10 or 12 hours, uh, depending on that fatty meal that you've ingested. So we can use this to our advantage when treating certain conditions. If we want a person's blood level to be sustained a longer period of time, uh, I might take a cannabis uh, cracker at bedtime with peanut butter and sleep all night long because it's not metabolized as fast. You could use uh, inhaled cannabis to induce sleep, but again, it's not going to last but only an hour or two. If you want to sleep all night long, you should use something ingested in order to get that much longer duration of action. <clears throat> so dosing uh, quantities is, is quite a range from from microdosing of a milligram or a few milligrams of cannabis to hundreds of milligrams of cannabis per day if you're using it for seizure disorders or cancers or other things. Uh, you might use it multiple times a day. You might use it uh, just ad lib, as needed. So again, people with migraine headache might only use it as needed if they're feeling a headache coming on. Daily administration for many conditions might be appropriate where you're taking it two or three times a day. Uh, patients with autism, patients with dementia, I'm going to encourage them to take it two or three times a day. And other people might find cannabis more useful multiple times a day, especially if they prefer using it inhaled, where it's only lasting a couple hours at a time. The drug warriors love to look at this and talk about uh, the cannabis uh, use disorder, where you're using cannabis all the time as if this is an addiction. Well, I'm not saying that people can't abuse cannabis, but I, am, but I am saying that for many people, regular use of cannabis might be the most appropriate uh, method of administration because it just quiets the brain down in ways that it otherwise is unable to do unless you're using cannabis on a regular t uh, basis, that is to say every, every few hours. <clears throat> now, I wanted to speak about the variability of cannabis, and cannabis is quite different from variety to variety, and many of you already understand this. Some might make you feel kind of spaced and out of control. Others might be really uh, enlightening and soothing and just fun. And they're different, maybe not so much in the cannabinoid content, although different cannabinoids may have that effect. It, it could be from an influence of the terpene fraction. There was a paper just come out a couple weeks ago showing that if people were given about a 10 milligram dose of THC, many of them handled it, got stoned. Others got anxious and didn't like the feeling of it. And then they switched it and gave the same dose of THC, but now they mixed it with limonene, which is a, a common terpene in cannabis. And the effect was it soothed that uh, effect of the, the anxious, paranoid kind of feeling that some of the uh, participants were experiencing. So these terpenes have a modulating effect on the cannabinoids. In this particular graphic, THC is on the far right-hand column, the blacker 
Uh, the concentration is on the bottom of the chart, and it's very light in the top of the chart. CBD, on the other hand, is very dark, dark at the top of the chart and very uh, light on the bottom of the chart. So you don't get a lot of CBD and a lot of THC unless you're blending uh, different varieties of cannabis together to make a medicine, or there are, uh, there's a zone in the middle where it's kind of equal in the THC and the CBD. But the point I also want to make is that <clears throat> these minor cannabinoids are quite different from variety to variety. And if we're looking to get an effect from a minor cannabinoid, we may be able to do that by knowing which strains have high CBG or high CBDV or high CB whatever. There are uh, you know, the majority of these cannabinoids are named, but there's a big percentage of them that are still unnamed. They just have a number. We have a long way to go in understanding the use of these minor cannabinoids. If we had a free hand at research, we could really uncover some of the uses of these minor cannabinoids. Relevance of minor cannabinoids. I, I wanted to speak briefly about this because I'm pointing out the fact that these minor cannabinoids are there and for pot smokers, we love the THC. We don't smoke, we don't go for CBD when we're going to the dispensaries in California or anywhere else. Uh, CBD is not very noticeable and not very pleasurable, <clears throat> but THC is what we go for. So my, my point is that when when we're looking at the minor cannabinoids, we're seeing some things that are very interesting. And in, in this particular graphic, <coughs> excuse me, in this particular graphic, uh, compound 266 was a high CBD strain that was being used or is being used in Israel to treat kids with autism. They have kind of a federal policy in Israel that they're not using THC for the kids with autism, they're just using high CBD. So kids are getting 300 milligrams of CBD per day. Well, they were going along with about a 20 to 1 ratio of CBD to THC for these kids, and it was working rather well. And what happened was, that they ran out of this particular varietal and they decided, okay, we'll substitute a different high CBD variety that again is about a 20 to 1 ratio of CBD to THC. That compound was compound 267 or the, com the column on the right. So even though the THCA in this case and the CBDA uh, in the flowers from this plant are essentially the same concentration, it didn't work, and the kids fell out of control and were getting anxious, violent, their behaviors were bad, and the, the uh, researchers realized there's something different about this, even though the ratio of t CBD to THC is virtually the same. Uh, if, if I look at this graphic, I'm going to say, well, it looks to me like those compounds that have a V in them, the varin molecules, the varin molecules are one with, ones with a shorter tail. So THC has a five carbon tail, the varins have a three carbon tail. And so if you look at the varins, they're there in the product that worked, and they're not really there in the product that didn't work. When they went back to the original cultivar, chemovar, as we heard yesterday in a conference, uh, the kids all came back under control again. So these differences in minor cannabinoids are very significant. And they're not only uh, different, you know, significant in treating uh, autism, they're also uh, significant in looking at the way we can kill cancer cells in the laboratory. Here's a graphic on these uh, slides, on the nine slides in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, we're comparing how well extract one, two, and three are able to kill the cells of colon cancers, breast cancers, and prostate cancers. In the extract number one, which is a high THC strain, uh, on this second column from the left, uh, the high THC extract could kill the colon cancer cells, the breast cancer cells, but it didn't do very well on the, on the prostate cancer cells. In the next line, it's a high CBD strain. And similarly, it killed most of the colon and the breast cancer cells, but didn't do well at all in killing the cells 
in the prostate uh, cancer. And then they took another high CBD varietal and treated the, the cells in vitro in these petri dishes. And in this other variety, they found that they uh, didn't do well at all in killing the colon cancer and the breast cancer cells, but it killed most of the prostate cancer cells. So this is the kind of thing that we're seeing in basic research, uh, looking at these uh, different cannabinoids and really looking at the, uh, wondering what's different, wondering if it's in these minor cannabinoids that we're seeing the difference. And I, I didn't really expound on this much, except in this one graphic here, uh, we're looking at lung, human lung cancer cells grown in vitro. And for a few of the strains, the blue line, green line, gray line, uh, even the red line, fairly low concentrations of cannabis extract was able to kill these cancer cells. But in other uh, cannabis varietals, it didn't do well at all in killing these cells in vitro. So again, we don't know exactly what's going on, but we do know that different varieties of cancer, different cultivars or chemo chemovars have a different potential of killing cancer cells. And it may very well be simply in the cannabinoids, but it also may be in the terpene fraction as well, or other compounds that are in the cannabis. So we have a lot of research to do in really teasing apart what's different between these different varietals. Unfortunately, when I've asked my uh, colleagues in Israel to, to uh, tell me what strains these are that did a better job in killing cells, uh, they couldn't reveal it. They've promised the owners of these varietals that they wouldn't reveal what these uh, different strains names are, which is sad but true that it really gets down to the money eventually and ownership of the genomes of these cultivars that is uh, so important to the to industry. They want to control these products. Uh, if research is done in the universities in Australia or anywhere else in the world, this information should be made public and we ought to be able to know what works best for what cancers or what works best for seizures or what works best for autism or whatever the medical problem is that we're treating. So I get down to this driving issue. This is kind of... You know, all, you, you don't need somebody coming from the United States and telling you that the uh, taking people's licenses away for these trace amounts of cannabinoids on swabs is, uh, is a logical way, uh, way to behave. It is illogical and it's just cruel. And so, uh, again, I don't need to be the one to tell you this. It's just, it's stupid. Uh, I think having comprehensive driver's training is very important. I think uh, law enforcement training is very important. As you move away from swabbing to see if somebody has any cannabinoid in their body, you're going to really need to look at whether somebody is driving impaired. And this comes from uh, educating the public on not driving impaired and educating law enforcement into really being able to look at people as to whether they show any signs of impairment. I did cite some references here. Uh, these are some that I think are important to be able to look at. Uh, one of them uh, at, the, at the bottom here is entitled, Residual Blood THC Levels in Frequent Cannabis U Users uh, After Over Four Hours of Abstinence. When people use cannabis r frequently, they may have residual levels of THC that could be impairing at that concentration to somebody who's a neophyte to the use of cannabis. So people with experience in using cannabis can have quite high blood levels of cannabinoids and be driving very safely. And so the evidence shows that in these National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Administration research uh, papers that were presented to Congress most recently in 2017 and in this review in 2019, it just shows that uh, it isn't as simple as a blood level like you have with blood alcohol. Uh, cannabinoid levels are entirely different and don't really uh, coincide with impairment. So we have to throw out this uh, uh, evidence of taking trace amounts of cannabinoids and telling people that 
we've got zero tolerance to this for this. You got to, you're losing your license. It's just cruel and unusual. So, time? Yes. Uh, this is actually my last slide. I think a good education begets appropriate legislation uh, in Parliament and anywhere in the United States. Uh, driving up with zero tolerance is cruel and illogical. Uh, when we have medicines that are available in the marketplace, as we get into a future use of cannabis here in this country, uh, <clears throat> potency for uh, medications greater than 5 or 10 milligrams of THC should be marked specially so that people aren't unwaringly taking huge doses of THC and getting wiped out. Uh, if we're selling dabs and tars and rosins, we also ought to understand that there's a risk of overdose in these products because they're so concentrated that even one puff will knock you on your can. And we've seen injuries when people take one puff and fall over and break their skulls open or, or break their arms and shoulders uh, just with one puff. Uh, having a certificate of analysis I've mentioned as being important. Uh, I've grown up using smoked cannabis up until the past year, and I think vaporizers, especially as we get older, are much more sensible because we're not irritating the airway as we, in the same way with vaporizers as we do with smoke. And I would add at the bottom here, don't complicate the use of cannabis with tobacco. I know you do here and in Western Europe, uh, and really throughout the world, use cannabis and, and uh, tobacco together. But in my uh, opinion, uh, sensible use of cannabis is to use it without tobacco. So that's the end of my uh, talk, and I'm happy to take uh, your questions if, uh, if we have a few minutes. Yes, we definitely have a bit of time for some questions, Jeff. So um, just wait for us to get the mic to you. There's someone coming behind you. Provided it's on. Uh, I'm very interested in, um, as you know, we recently changed the, the schedule of some of our drugs in Australia, and what you see the future of, um, at the moment, it's seen as a secondary, it's, you know, you have a primary big pharma drug and you use it alongside it. Do you see a future of it being a, a primary treatment? And, sorry, I've got two, I'm gonna be greedy here, but the other one is I'm, I'm very interested in uh, what your experience is with treating demyelinating diseases or the, the neurodegenerative diseases like MS and those. Say the name of that disease again. And Demyelinating, like the, the, the nerve degenerated um, diseases, whether you've treated and, and have experience with results from that as well. Well, unless I'm misunderstanding or know it by a different name, I, I don't know that I've treated that disease. Multiple sclerosis. Oh, I'm sorry. Example. Yes, of course. Uh, I have an unusual experience with multiple sclerosis in that one of my patients was a secretary at a Kaiser facility uh, uh, in a neuro clinic and so I ended up with about 70 or 80 patients with multiple sclerosis in my practice. Uh, th that's a rather large number uh, compared to other docs in my practice or in, in, in cannabinoid medicine. Uh, what I have found was that some, uh, not uniformly, but many of the patients using cannabis for their um, multiple sclerosis stabilized them and they did not use conventional pharmaceuticals with multiple sclerosis. Many go on to use, whether they just feel pressed to do it or they just got into use of, of conventional pharmaceuticals for multiple sclerosis before they learned about cannabis, that may be the case. But in my experience, uh, many people have gone without progression of their multiple sclerosis and in fact many of the patients that I'm following still with multiple sclerosis are uh, telling me that there's evidence in their uh, MRI brain scans that the MS has just burned out. It, the lesions are changed in their appearance in the MRI. They don't seem to be active any longer and they again it's kind of burned out MS and I think this uh, can can be attributed to the cannabis, and I, if we had studies really designed to reveal that, I think we would, we would find that to be true. Uh, the other question is about using cannabis as a primary medicine, and I think absolutely, and as I got you know, into the beginning of this slide set and, and went through these many things, many people are using cannabis only for 
uh, depressive disorders, for anxiety disorders, for PTSD, for ADHD, and on and on the list goes. And if they have, can learn to use cannabis, uh, which is fairly simple, but it, it does take some practice to get familiar with cannabis and, and use it to your best effect, it can uh, basically replace or displace the use of conventional pharmaceuticals for many uh, conditions. Uh, that are well treated with cannabinoids. So uh, I, I'm excited about that and I see people come in using medicines and they'll ask me if I think that they may be able to uh, rid themselves of other medicines as the time goes along and I, I have to say, well, yes, I really do. I, I don't want to be too goal-oriented and I don't stop their use of conventional medicines initially. I just want them to get comfortable and familiar with cannabis use and then consider whether or not they need to continue the use of conventional medicines as well. Uh, thanks for that question. Please raise your hand. Yep. He's coming up behind you. <laughs> um, my question is just about the effects of um, uh, THC on sleep, um, particularly dreaming. And the, the, my understanding is, is that there is a reduction in REM sleep um, under the effects of cannabis. Um, but my experience is from my watch monitoring my sleep is that I probably get a bit less than the benchmark for my age, but I still definitely seem to be having REM sleep. But I never ever remember my dreams. Um, under cannabis, and when you go off cannabis for a while, you often start to remember your dreams a lot more easily. Uh, thanks for that uh, point and question. And I've heard that in my practice uh, many times over the years, but I, I want to point out uh, something else, and that is that when we think of cannabis as a remedy for post-traumatic stress disorder, what we're trying to do is uh, deal with aversive memories. And so what uh, if two people go through a bad experience in their life, whether they were in the military or whatever, some people will go right on into life and have no problem in, in getting on with their lives. Other people will dwell on these past memories and can't get them out of their heads. And certain triggers will bring those memories right back very vividly to people. And what cannabis is able to do as a medicine is to alter our short-term memory. And so I'm pointing this out uh, because it is true. Cannabis does interfere with short-term memory. Uh, the more we use cannabis, the more we can uh, compensate for that fact. And that short-term memory is not really an issue for chronic cannabis users. Uh, at the same time, I would say that uh, we may have those dreams, and honestly, this is what I believe, that we still continue to dream when we are under the influence of cannabis. It's just that by the moment you wake up, you're not remembering the dream any longer. It just sort of falls into that void of, uh, I don't know if I had a dream or not, or if I did, it's just you can't hand, you know, hang on to it very well. I, I think the REM sleep question is not entirely answered. Uh, I think that REM sleep is possible under the influence of cannabis and does exist. It's just that in some studies it shows that may be, there may be a diminished uh, REM sleep. Uh, but I do think that the uh, short-term memory loss about those dream states uh, is, is a real thing. So um, I don't see it as harm to people's uh, sleep uh, and getting good quality sleep. In fact, people will repeatedly tell me that sleep has never been so good uh, since they've been using cannabis at, at bedtime. So, uh, thanks for that question. Do we have any more questions before we wrap up? We'll, have, we'll make you the last one. And yeah, and if anyone would like to continue the conversation with Dr. Hergen Ruther, he will be around here today. So please feel free, but here's one more. Hi there. I've I've had um, a brain tumour called meningioma, and it was surgically removed and left a hole in my brain. Could um, cannabis help with that, with um, recalibrating the brain? Uh, it's not a simple question. Thanks for that question. Uh, 
There are some tumors that are more sensitive to, uh, brain tumors that are more sensitive to cannabinoids than others. Meningiomas in my practice have not been particularly sensitive. I've seen them to uh, not uh, pro progress in their growth, but I haven't seen them shrink under the influence of cannabis as far as meningiomas. There is a role of cannabis, though, in, in um, helping the brain with uh, the neuroprotective role. And I think this is a, an important role of cannabinoids that is uh, underappreciated. Uh, when, um, when we first discovered the neuroprotective role of cannabinoids in brain injuries, uh, this was done in the United States in the 1990s. And what they were doing was they were ligating the blood vessels going to the brain of animals and inducing strokes and starving the brain of uh, any oxygen for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever the time duration was, in animals that had uh, been either pre-treated with cannabinoids or not treated with cannabinoids. And those that were treated with cannabinoids had much less injury to the brain. Uh, the stroke volume was far reduced when can cannabinoids were there. And when, when the researchers discovered this, they uh, explained that this was a neuroprotective role of cannabinoids. and uh, they have then turned the patent over to the Department of Health and Human Services, which still holds the patent for cannabinoids as neuroprotectants. So neuroprotection is a, a real thing. And when the brain has been damaged or injured, uh, the use of cannabis, the sooner the better, I think is important to protecting cells that are at, at risk. Uh, the, the production of new cells, the the n n neural development is also possible under the influence of cannabinoids, natural cannabinoids and plant cannabinoids as well. There is some research on this, uh, but it's uh, not fully developed. Uh, we have animal models of that fact. Uh, there are other brain tumors that are more sensitive to cannabinoids. Uh, some of the astrocytomas and the gliocyte, uh, glio gliomas and the glioblastomas even within the same name, the, the uh, tumors have different receptors on the cell membranes. The tumors have cannabinoid receptors as well. And the thought is that if there are more cannabinoid receptors on the surface of those uh, brain cells, uh, brain tumor cells, whether they're meningiomas or neuromas or glioblastomas or astrocytomas, they may be more prone to control with the cannabinoids. So I encourage people with, cannab with uh, brain tumors to use cannabinoids. Uh, I can't attest to any evidence to show that it's helping with meningiomas as far as causing them to shrink. Uh, but I think in terms of the other neuroprotective roles and the uh, growth of new s brain cells, this is a role that is in part supported by cannabinoids. Well, thank you very, on that very positive note. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather. Thank you Greatly. very much.